we are going to get started here right away. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, we have a great room of people here in person. Oh, and we also have a good crowd attending online. So welcome, whether you're online or in person. Uh, my name is Amy Crothers, and I am the Program Development Manager at Egg West Bio. Um, I want to get started in a good way and acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. As a settler to Treaty 6 territory, I acknowledge and respect and admire the First Nation and Métis people who have deep roots in this rich agricultural land we call home. Let's strive to work together, build bridges, and reaffirm our relationship with one another. So now you've probably noticed that uh, I am not Karen Churchill, the president and CEO of Egg West Bio. Um, Karen is unfortunately sick today, so you're stuck with me. Um, this just means that you all have to work harder because I have looked at the attendance list and I know we have a lot of experts here in the room on biological products. Um, so I'm hoping that you will all chime in pretty early on um, and we can really let this discussion go and uh, get lots of questions from the people in the room. So welcome to the Knowledge Farm. We are pleased to partner with Innovation Saskatchewan to bring you the Knowledge Farm series. Innovation Saskatchewan is the central agency for the government of Saskatchewan responsible for implementing the province's innovation priorities. Innovation Saskatchewan is committed to supporting and growing Saskatchewan's tech sector and research community through economic investments that bolster the innovation ecosystem. EggWest Bio is Saskatchewan's Bioscience Industry Association, a catalyst and connector of research and business working to develop the bioeconomy in our province here. We assist companies through advice, pathfinding, and funding, and we also offer networking opportunities to help build community and encourage collaborations like the Knowledge Farm. The Knowledge Farm is Saskatchewan's premier forum producing connections that grow innovative ideas in, agri in agri food and bioscience. So with Knowledge Farm events, we often explore various technologies and trends that are important to our agri food community here in Saskatchewan. Another goal is to get people together to discuss these topics and help build a community and make connections. So I encourage you all to get to know one another. Um, there might be some unfamiliar faces, so please uh, introduce yourself and, uh, and chat after our fireside chat today. So today we are asking, what's the buzz on biologicals? Biologicals are not new to this region. In fact, Egg West Bio actually hosted a series of, com series of conferences back in the early 2000s I was not at Egg West at that time, called Biological Futures. And did you know the world's first phosphorus inoculant was developed right here in Saskatoon almost 40 years ago? So this afternoon, we're gonna discuss that fascinating story and delve into what happened in the biologicals industry since. So to do that, we have two experts with us today in the field of biologicals. Um, we have John Trelor here, a technical agronomy lead for Novozymes BioEggs North American commercial team. And we have Ingrid Fung, the Director of in Enterprise Operations and Strategy at Greenlight Biosciences. So John Trelor is a technical agronomy lead and with, experience, with expertise in biologicals, field trials, agronomy, soil health and sustainable agriculture. He has a passion for the use and adoption of biologicals in agriculture. John has been instrumental in the development and promotion of new biological solutions for growers. John grew up in Abbotsford, BC, and graduated from UBC with a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture or in Agroecology and a Horticulture major before working in the crop protection IPM industry in the Fraser Valley. He moved to Saskatchewan in 2005 and worked in the College of Egg Bio at the U of S, where he developed high school curriculum resources and held science teacher workshops to help broaden the scope of agricultural understanding in the school system. John said he, he says he resides in Saskatoon because he has a fondness of bitter cold and a fear of mountains. There's no sarcasm in that at all. So John, welcome. Next, I'd like to, do, to introduce Ingrid Fung, who's joining us online from Toronto. So we can all see you, Ingrid, so welcome. Um, Ingrid is the Director of Enterprise Operations and Strategy at Greenlight Biosciences, a Boston-based biotech, biotech firm focused on creating healthy people and planet through RNA innovations, where Ingrid leads strategic initiatives and heads up investor relation efforts. With over a decade of experience in ag tech innovation and investment, 
Ingrid ha held leadership roles in business development, strategic advisory, technical development, and venture capital. Ingrid is an advisor to several accelerators and sits on the external advisory board for Ag Tech Next. She is passionate about science, communication, growing the Canadian innovation ecosystem, and diversity and inclusion in the STEM fields. So welcome Ingrid and John. Okay, well, we, I think we'll just get right into things. I'm gonna sit down. And my first question is for you, John. Um, so we gave a bit of your background and we, we talked about how the world's first phosphorus inoculant jumpstart was created right here in Saskatchewan in the 1980s by Philom Bios. Can you briefly tell us about um, the research that was happening at the company in those early days um, and how it's in, evolved into the work that you're doing now with Novozymes? Sure. On, okay, there we go. Great, welcome everyone and thanks for the invite to speak today. I think it's, uh, it's very timely with the attention on biologicals right now and it's probably been a while since Novozymes has engaged with the, the science community here. But if we look at uh, back at the development days, I mean, Saskatoon really has a proud history of egg biological development. This goes back to the kind of mid to mid to late 80s and early 90s, where a couple of companies really started up around here and have had a pretty profound impact on the global biological, the egg biological kind of footprint that we that we see today. And when we think back to that time in the 80s and 90s, I mean, there really was no big global biological industry as we see today, right? Growers around the prairies were using fertilizers. It was cheap, right? The, they were available all the time. The environmental impacts weren't really being felt yet. And it was just business as usual. And at the same time, the universities, you know, here especially, but around the world had done a lot of work on biological product development, but it really wasn't making it past that benchtop kind of idea, right? The formulations and the applications weren't there, but the knowledge definitely was. And at the same time, around the late 80s, right, we saw the importance of innovation and commercialization of innovation around Saskatoon. So the development of the research park here, some corporations and, and organizations like Ag West Bio, right, the, the pilot plants that are around here, Plant Biotech Institute, all of this came together around commercialization. So from that, two important companies were born, right? There's Phil and Bios, which came out of a couple of researchers at the university, uh, John Cross, George Cachatorians, John Shaw, right? Those are kind of our, our founding fathers of Phil and Bios, which became Novozymes. And then the, I'm gonna, microbial rhizogen, I might get that wrong, cause I'm up here, but that was the, which became Becker Underwood, which became BASF, right? Or was, was through acquisitions and whatnot. So, Again, thinking back to that time in the late 80s and early 90s, no biological industry. At the same time, the pulse industry was coming up. So the work of the CDC and, and all of the work going into lentils and peas and getting the pulse footprint going and still fertilizing their, their crops that way. So along comes the biological industry from nothing, right? From, from the ground up and had to research and develop everything. So yes, we had to pick our strains and we had to pick our, the bugs that we wanted to work with but there's so much more than just that, right? I mean, there's all the work that goes into formulations and formulation developments between liquids or peats or granules, all the work around quality and making sure that those bugs stay alive for three months, six months, that when they get delivered into the field, they're gonna be ready to go to work for you, right? There's all the work that also went into the regulatory environment, because this was new to the federal government and probably wasn't CFIA at the time, but that regulatory piece also was you know facing a new type of product and the quality that came with it so the type of research i mean it was everything from from soup to nuts if you will right and the, i think back to those days i think the work that was done was so reliant on that academic community to back it up that the publications that came out of something like penicillium belli and the phosphate inoculants it wasn't just as a lot of companies do nowadays, treatment versus yield. Here's my two bushels off to the promised land we go, right? It was a lot more understanding of how the products worked, why they worked, where they were gonna work. And it was backed up by rigorous science, which is something I'll talk about a little bit more as we go through today. 
So, I mean, when you look at everything that had to develop to get that into a mainstream type of product, it's pretty incredible. And it's not just Phil and Bios or Novozymes or Becker Underwood. I mean, it was, it was nice to have two companies that could go head to head and compete against each other. But I mean, you go talk to a grower and you say, here's a bag of peat, put this on instead of 120 pounds of nitrogen and you'll get the same type of crop yield. They look at, why are you selling me this bag of dirt, right? And I mean, it took a lot of visionary people to make that work. And if anyone had the pleasure of meeting John Cross, I think it's pretty incredible the work and the passion that he put into it. So when you say, you know, what's the research that went into it? Like so much, right? Everything. But I think, you know, when it really comes down to it, I think the strains and the organisms themselves and the formulation is, is really, really important. Excellent. Thank you, John. Yeah, that gives a really good background to kind of the history here um, in Saskatoon and in Saskatchewan. Um, so Ingrid is joining us, uh, we said from Toronto. Um, and Ingrid, I have a question for you. So Greenlight Biosciences has developed an RNA platform uh, to help feed the world and keep it healthy. So can you tell us a little bit more about what kind of products Greenlight is producing with this RNA platform and really who these products are for? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I think it's important to kind of back up and, and tell people a little bit about RNA. So, you know, we're talking about biologicals here in a really, really broad sense, and we're including everything from microbial inoculants that are living organisms all the way over to RNA, where green light plays, right? And I think when we're using the term biological, oftentimes people think of what we at green light or in the industry call kind of biologicals 1.0, where you have living organisms that sometimes, as John alluded to, can be really, really tricky to translate from lab to field. Where we play is in working with biological molecules. So RNA is a robust biological molecule. It's found in every living thing and in all of the foods that we eat. And what we do at green light is harness these biomolecules so that we can develop proven and effective pesticides that degrade quickly in the environment, leave little to no residue and are highly targeted so that we can not only enable growers to be more sustainable in their food production, but be effective. And so moving to the question of kind of who are these products for, um, essentially we're hoping at some point to be able to help catalyze the transition away from the use of synthetic AIs in crop protection. So We've got products in our platform that span everything from insecticides to fungicides to acaricides. And recently we've kind of cracked the nut from a formulations and delivery perspective into implanted delivery. So we're going after herbicides as well. And so, you know, we're starting out with our first product, knock on wood, that should be registered with the EPA um, in a matter of days uh, against Colorado potato beetle. But we've got um, products in the pipeline that are really targeted at everybody from high value growers all the way to uh, broad acreage row crop applications. Excellent, thank you, Ingrid. Um, yeah, super interesting. So you're based out of the US, um, but, and, and John just gave a little bit of information about Saskatoon and Saskatchewan. And I know, you know, you've been looking at that a little bit. So tell us more about kind of why Greenlight might be looking at Saskatchewan and Canada as an opportunity to expand and maybe you're not anymore. Just tell me a little bit about that process and uh, what's been going on there. Yeah, for sure. Um, so we actually um, recently partnered with uh, Jeff Berthelet uh, and Ag West Bio to kind of set up a small administrative office in Saskatoon. And part of the reason why we're attracted to doing work in Saskatoon and in Canada is because we've got such a strong research and development ecosystem in Canada. Um, there's such a depth and breadth of talent when it comes to agricultural tech development um, and field trials capabilities that you really just don't see in a lot of other places. So actually we've been running trials for our Fusarium product um, solution in wheat in Saskatoon for a number of years now, and saw that as an opportunity really to try and expand the scope of R&D that we're doing here, partnered with Agriculture Agri-Food Canada, um, to try and look at issues that, um, you know, may be interesting for the Canadian and Saskatchewan ecosystem as well, um, looking beyond what we're doing just in the US, um, in Europe and in South America. So looking north of the border to, you know, solutions that may be applicable to canola and other crops that are a lot more dominant in Canada and in other geographies, but aren't maybe, you know, top of mind for the U.S. market. 
I need to stop turning this off because it takes a little bit to turn back on. Thanks, Ingrid. Um, Kay, I want to open it up already for audience questions. Just as you guys are thinking, if there's questions that come to mind, just stick your hand up, let me know, and, and we'll get it to you. Um, but another question I have is I, I want to talk a little bit about the regulatory side. John kind of alluded to it earlier, but um, I guess what are the challenges that companies face in getting new biologicals regis registered within Canada? Um, and then a little bit about about the US too and maybe the, the contrast between the two. Um, do you want to start with that, John, and then Ingrid can follow up? Sure. So I think you know, we might have a little different perspective on this because our, our products for the most part right now are in that 1.0, as you say, the organisms themselves. So in Canada, other than bureaucracy and the time delay for CFIA to register products, which has been frustrating in the last couple of years, it's pretty straightforward. And it's really changed the biological marketplace out in the field. In 2013 or 2014, they dropped the requirements for efficacy, right? So when they did that, it really became a buyer beware environment. So yes, you have to prove safety and you have to prove the toxicology and the phytotoxicity and, and that piece, environmental, human safety, all of that, which I mean, as any type of egg input you should do and need to do. But after that, the requirement to prove efficacy is gone. And when that happened, there were literally hundreds of new products entering the marketplace. So, you know, from, I think from my perspective on the ground is that in Canada, biologicals for a fertility product through CFIA, it's pretty straightforward. It's just a bit lengthy as commercial people they always want to sell. So it's right now 12 months or more, maybe six or maybe 18 months, depending on, on the backlog. But because we're not proving efficacy in that sense, it's, it's quite wide open. On the biofungicide side of things or on the, the pest management side of things, you do still need to prove efficacy. Uh, so, I mean, if you know, obviously you want your products to work, but through the PMRA, similar, you know, safety products or safety testing and whatnot needs to be there, but the efficacy is there. But that's a little bit faster, but still around that year delay. After that, it's, you know, there's no provincial regulations. There's really no barriers to entry and it, it should be manageable to register products. Now, in the states, you've got the EPA as kind of an overarching body, and then you've got individual states, which makes it a lot more, I think, a lot more complicated. Europe is a similar type of thing where you've got kind of a European registration, and then you've got individual countries, and this country accepts data from over there, but not over here. And it, I think Canada is pretty easy other than that 12 to 18 month delay. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, Ingrid, what do you think um, with your experience? So I would say we've had the opposite experience. So we find actually Canada a pretty onerous and difficult um, regulatory system to navigate. And I know that this uh, opinion is shared by, so I'm on the board of Life Science Ontario, full disclosure. So a number of our ag, um, ag tech companies that are within uh, the Life Science Ontario membership have always, have sorry, have also come across these issues. So the PMRA is relatively difficult to deal with when it comes to new technology and new technology development. Um, there are really, really long bureaucratic timelines compared to the US when it comes to even starting small plot field trials for new technologies in Canada. And so that puts a limit on how you can prepare your regulatory dossier or how quickly you can get started with preparing a regulatory dossier for Canada. Um, and when you layer on top of that, that Canada requires two years of in-country field trial data before you can actually submit your regulatory dossier with the PMRA, it makes it very, very difficult for countries actually to prioritize Canada as a market for, um, you know, early entry for their products because it's just so unknown when it comes to, you know, the timeline to approval to start your early stage field trials, to get your dossier together, and even trying to get a um, pre-submission meeting with a PMRA can often be very, very challenging. And this has to do with um, the mandate of the PMRA, which is the Pest Management Regulatory Association in Canada, um, in contrast to the EPA, which has a dual mandate to um, not only protect the environment, but counts among it industry and growers as their stakeholders, PMRA's primary stakeholders are viewed as the public. And so instead of, you know, necessarily sometimes listening to growers around where some of their crop protection needs are or where they need access to innovation, PMRA really strictly looks at regulatory dossiers under a safety and risk management perspective, and it makes it 
quite difficult oftentimes for countries to, or sorry, for companies to prioritize Canada um, from a business planning perspective. So, and do you think, Ingrid, that that's related to it being the, like the 1.5 or 2.0 biologicals versus what uh, John's talking about or across the board? Um, this is a, across the board for most. So that's not only biologicals related, this is, has to do with um, novel active ingredients for other crop protection solutions as well and novel formulation ingredients. So um, there's a Canadian company uh, called Vive Crop Protection based here in Ontario. They're viewed as the um, you know, leading or fastest growing ag tech company here in Canada, you know, Canadian grown. Um, I'm good friends with their CEO, Darren. Uh, they've received a lot of Canadian non-dilutive funding from SDTC and other groups, but, you know, their first Canadian registration, they only received it this year, right? And this is a formulations company where the technology was developed, grown and funded publicly by Canadians, so... Okay, interesting. Well, I think this kind of leads um, with kind of two different perspectives into my next question on uh, where does Canada sit globally kind of on the production and adoption of biological products in agriculture? And maybe John, you can speak more to your experience with producers and farmers here in the prairie provinces sure. um, in terms of, yeah, are we, are we adopting these products? For prairie agriculture, yes. I mean, if we look at, as I said, where we started with pulse growers fertilizing, where we are today with you know six to eight million acres of pulses getting inoculated every year i when i'm talking it's 99 percent of pulse growers are inoculating their crops every year it's just standard practice soybean growers in canada you know the majority of those people are as well whether they think of those as biologicals or not i'm not sure because i mean it's just such a well-known system the nitrogen fixing through rhizobia right now if you get into some of the other technologies such as like jump starter as that's evolved into what we call bionic now and phosphorus solubilizers other nutrient solubilizing technology that's where we're you know the adoption is still coming and as the conversation around soil health and soil biology has become much more mainstream and accepted it's not we're not in that snake oil foo foo dust realm as much and i say as much because i'm still still the snake oil salesman at times but that conversation is a lot easier to have now because of the soil health conversations that are going on right and so adoption is coming and when we saw fertilizer prices skyrocket and availability become a lot more questionable a couple of years ago and with the the ukraine war when that kind of came about when phosphorus prices are $1,200, $1,500 a pound, or sorry, a ton, then we're getting into a conversation where new solutions are needed, right? And combine that with all the knowledge around soil biology and the importance of it, then that those eyebrows aren't raised as much, right? And so, so I gave a talk last year in Shaunavon, a lot of cattle grower or cattle like farmers, <clears throat> grain producers down there, a lot of the kind of the older generation of farmers and I was talking about biocontrol, talking about inoculants and the, and, you know, I had a ton of questions and people coming up afterwards and talking about it. And I thought if I can kind of pass the sniff test in that crowd, it's showing me that the, the conversation is definitely changing right now, as far as production goes, I mean, Novozymes globally, we are the, the number one biological producing company in the world, not just in agriculture, but across a whole, bunch of industries. We just acquired the world's number two. So there's a ton of expertise when it comes to production and fermentation, whether that be liquid fermentation or dry fermentation right here in town. Interestingly enough, you know, we're prob between us and BSF, we're probably 80% of market share and they produce two doors down from us up on Thatcher Avenue. So and there's a lot of expertise here when it comes to the production of microbes. And it, it's, it's great to be part of that. We know we have people that are 30, 35 years with the company that started out with Phil and Bios and to, you know, to where we are today. And you know, I'll, I'll put it out there again at the end, but you know, for a group like AgWest Bio or any of the groups that want to come through tours and our doors are open, they haven't been for a few years because of COVID and, and whatnot, but I mean, come see the technology. It's, it's pretty impressive to have a look at. I do have to give a shout out to Mary Leggett, who's on line here with us. And oh, nice. I, so she was 
part of uh, oh. Phil and Bios and some of this technology, I think, pretty early on. Just a little bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. You so, know, Mary, she was pretty instrumental in developing this technology. So that's great. Yeah. So hi, Mary. Shout out to you. Um, Ingrid, what are, what are your thoughts? So I think John brings up a really several really interesting points, right? There's a lot of talent in Canada when it comes to production. There's clearly, you know, grower demand and interest, right? So what we found in talking to Canadian growers and grower groups is there's such an enthusiasm um, for adopting and trying new technologies. It's the access and development piece that they struggle with, right? And so John's mentioned a number of large companies, Novozymes, BASF, you know, large corporations that are producing and selling in Canada. What we have see a little bit of a gap in Canada for is really, you know, not so much the discovery stage, but that development stage where you're seeing, you know, a lot of Canadian startups pop up around the biological space. And this harkens back to my time in venture. Um, so a lot of Canadian startups hopping up around the biological space, but they grow to a certain stage, you know, and then they get acquired, right, and tucked into a larger organization as, you know, a bolt-on business. Um, where we're not seeing a ton of stuff in Canada is that kind of growth stage for biologicals companies, right? You're not seeing a lot of Canadian grown, developed um, companies that are taking their products to market and having their products developed. And I think a lot of that harkens back to the complexity of the regulatory system, particularly when you're talking about um, biological crop protection solutions. It, it's tough. Um, it's tough to figure out and it's tough to survive as a small company if you're pre-revenue and you're developing solutions and the regulatory outcomes and the regulatory timelines are really unknown. And so, you know, I have to say that Canada definitely is a leader in you know, the really early stage discovery side, as evidenced by a lot of the companies that, you know, mentioned that had technology and discovery built right from Saskatoon. And we've got a lot of grower interest and demand, but we got to work on that middle portion to try and kind of bring more of that innovation and growth to Canada and to Saskatchewan. Excellent. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, do we have questions from the audience on, I think that's a good time to, to open it up and see. Yeah. Oh, you should be able to just go ahead and speak loud. There's a mic right here. <laughs> the big blue light is the light. Yeah. I'm interested in your thoughts about, you know, we see in the U.S. a lot of these non-associated nitrogen fixtures, like I'm thinking of Proven 40 or Proven N, and I'm wondering what you're seeing in the northern prairies. If, you know, there's questions out about how efficacy those are even in the south. And I'm wondering for those sort of nitrogen fixtures, you know, I'm thinking the Frankie or other sort of inoculants that aren't associated with pulses, if you're seeing, what's the feeling about when you're talking to people about, like the phosphorus polymerized bacteria are well known, they know what they do, they know how they work, and they've been proven for a long time. So what, what's your thoughts on when you hear from farmers and producers about, are you talking to anybody who has experience? Is there, do you think there's a need for that here? Is it, what's your, what's your experience? Is it foo foo dust or is, I have my doubts? Or I'd be curious about what you Yeah, that one. <laughs> yeah, it. Biologicals are very kind of a, a hot topic in agriculture at Commodity Classic last year down in the States, the big ag trade show, probably it felt like about 60% of the booths had an ag biological. Nitrogen fixation and non-legumes is the one of the holy grails, right? So combine that with some fancy marketing dollars and you can, you can place products out there. My sense is that we're not quite there yet and they don't really have a lot of legs under them. And that really is a threat to the overall biological industry that if companies are making claims because they, you know, they see something shiny, they want to go after that holy grail, maybe it's not quite there yet, but they've got the, some seed money, they've got some money to go out there, create some marketing dollars, create a, a retail system where people can make a lot of money from it. It gets into growers' hands and they don't see the 50 pounds of, of nitrogen fixation. They don't see the 100 pound replacement. Oh yeah, those biologicals don't work. So it's a big watch out. It's actually, to me, it's one of the threats because I don't think the claims are going to, what the companies are claiming aren't necessarily going to be backed up in the field. You know, I think maybe if we got into some genetic engineering of those bugs and that might improve some of the nitrogen, but I don't, I don't think we're there yet with the nitrogen fixation. I really just, I don't, does that help you? I mean, with, there's been a number that have been tried up here and not really, standing up to the claims made at least on their sell sheets yeah i mean we 
Novozymes has played in the nitrogen fixation space, but we just haven't developed the technology to where it needs to be in the field yet. Here's a question at the back there. Oh, yep, yep. Yeah. yeah. Maybe come a little bit closer. There's, this is the mic right here, just for everyone on Zoom. Yeah, go for it. So my question is for a little on that. Um, a lot of uh, biological that are microbial normally are affected by the environment that they're in, so they don't breathe on the environments. And one of the things we've seen is that if there is an environment where there's a high application of synthetic nitrogen, it, it doesn't work as well because it works better in a nitrogen deficient environment. So with that number and with the fact that a lot of people are trying to move away, like with the 30% reduction of fertilizer use, for example, uh, we're trying, you know, people are trying to uh, use some of the better for measures they have with biomedical. So what are your um, views on combining synthetic fertilizers with biomedicals and how can we move forward? Because one of the issues that we see in maybe different team health is because there's not going to help a lot of it. Right. So, because I don't have as much experience in the nitrogen realm, but in in the phosphorus realm, I mean, that was the tagline for Jumpstart or phosphorus inoculant for years is enhancing phosphate efficiency. That we never, I'm sorry, we don't position the product as a fertilizer replacement. It really is positioned as to make what you're using more efficient, whether that's background phosphorus or whether that's phosphorus that's that's added that year and tied up in the soil. It's making more of it available to the grower. Right? And so we're not saying, hey, just you don't need chemical phosphorus anymore, right? Phosphorus traditional fertilizer. We're saying what you're using, we can make more efficient. And I really look at at the equation as an integrated system. That we're not the silver bullet for phosphorus fertility, but we are part of that integrated system with traditional fertilizers, with good crop rotations, with you know, possibly manures or other inputs, but we can also look at our data and say we can deliver about 20, 20 pounds an acre of available phosphorus right now if you have 80 pounds available phosphorus and your crop only needs 60 and you add something like jumpstart and then say oh i didn't get a response that's why so i think one of the pitfalls of, of biologicals is just doing the treatment versus yield treatment versus yield testing and not looking at different fertility regimes not looking at the environments where they work and trying to make blanket statements that you're going to get x bushels return without thinking about the system that they're in so i i can speak a little bit to you know the the co-use of biologicals and and nitrogen right synthetic and biological fertilization or crop nutrition right this comes keep in mind i haven't been in venture for about a year and a half um for my time in venture looking at biological um biofertilization replacement regimes. Um, I can say, you know, a lot of what John said is, is absolutely spot on, right? Part of the challenge that we were seeing when we were looking at biologicals companies trying to look at nitrogen replacement was the fact that they were running trials across a whole bunch of different soil types, a whole bunch of, you know, biofertilization regimes, um, different cropping systems, and trying to see a high level overall pattern that they were getting an improvement in yield and a reduction in nitrogen loss. Most of these companies struggled year on year to show that they were actually producing a net benefit for using their solutions. Um, and part of that is that lack of specificity. There's a number of companies looking at trying to marry soil health um, soil composition data and historical yield data for essentially prescriptive biological use. Um, but it's very, very early days yet. There just doesn't exist that data set out there for people to be a little bit more specific as to when to use their solutions. Um, there's a number of groups trying to build that out, but it's so early days yet that it's, I think, a little bit impractical for most growers to be thinking about that. Awesome. That answered both. Yeah, that was really well answered. I'm just going to the chat here. Um, oh, yes. Okay. So first one for John, are you developing any disease management products other than, oh dear, F FOD for, is it phosphorus supplement? I'm guessing is what that's supposed to say. Phosphorus supplement. Yes. And then I'm just going to read here 
while Ingrid, we have a question after that for Ingrid that says, can you explain um, about your products? Oh, it's the same question that was already answered. We're good there. So just John's. Sure. Yeah. So traditionally, you know, for the first, say, 30 years, we were involved in biofertility. And in the last, probably, I'd say about, well, even a couple of years, but five years, we've got into the biocontrol space. So we do have two products, um, two separate products. There's Tegro 2, which is a bacillus, and we have Actinovate, which is a Streptomyces lydicus organism. And so we're pretty uh, established in the fruit and vegetable market down the West Coast and into Ontario, into Florida, uh, but mostly for the fruit and veg, that's just where it's been, been focused. Uh, we've done a little bit of development work on broad acre crops. You know, we were doing some work with Aphinomyces and Streptomyces as the as seed treatment. I'd like to continue on developing the broad acre solutions and looking at it as adding a new active and a new mode of action into the, the equation. Sometimes maybe replacing traditional chemistry, sometimes helping them become more efficient, but really thinking about the resistance management equation and using these new actives and these new modes of action to reduce resistance. And so again, we have a lot of efficacy data on the bench top and it's translating that into success in the field that becomes the challenge. And so when we have a product for strawberries, it's very difficult to have the same type of product for wheat and canola and, and whatnot, right? So making, we know it works, right? But now we've got to make it work in the field for broad acre. But for greenhouse and fruit and veg industry, we have two great products right now. And we've got proteins in the pipeline and we've got enzymes in the pipeline that'll be here, I think, in the next few years as well. So more, more solutions for growers in the biological realm. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions coming in? Oh, a few more in person here. I'll go here first and then to you. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. So yeah. I have a question to Ingrid. Uh, are you developing any uh, RNA technology or biocontrol products specific to Fusarium, Fusarium head blight? Yeah, so so that's um, the some of the field trials that I was referencing that we're doing in uh, partnership with Agriculture Agri-Food Canada in Saskatoon. So we are working on Fusarium in general, and specifically, we've got some trials against Fusarium head blight and wheat uh, in and around Saskatoon. So I guess I, I want to be conscious of time too, and I do want to ask you guys both um, a question here, kind of about, you know, we've talked about um, some of the challenges, some of the opportunities, but I did want to ask you to think from an innovator's perspective and people who are here in the R&D space, but also in the commercialization space, what is the biggest challenge that your two organizations are facing or where do you see the biggest opportunity for new innovation in biologicals? That's kind of a pick one or the other, I guess, or talk, talk about both. <laughs> sure, because we've kind of talked about this question a little bit before and was tossing around some of the commercial folks in the office today. And you know, for me, one of the biggest challenges is just actually at the, in the retail environment and the number of, of new companies that are trying to get out there with very, kind of unsubstantiated claims with very little or, or no science behind their products and they're cheap and they're just getting out there and it becomes a, a, a margin game at the retails that it's a race to the bottom and you know what's the cheapest one what's the one that I can you know get moved the, the fastest and make the most margin at and we do a lot of work around what I call the science agronomy and data that's how we like to position our products we can prove it in the field with hundreds of field trials. We can you know, work till we're blue in the face on proving the efficacy of the products. You get to the retail level and they're, they're being told to sell something else because they can make more money at it. And so that, that's, a, that's a hard pill to swallow when you're out there doing the work. And it's just like, no, I just want the cheapest one that you can get. So that, it's a little different than like the regulatory environment and the barriers to entry, but it's very real that when you get out to actually, you know, working with growers and working with the retails that are out there, it's sometimes it can be a race to the bottom and kind of takes the, the profitability out of it. Yeah. Interesting. Ingrid? Sorry, could you repeat the question? Yeah, yeah. Just wondering if you have any kind of the, the biggest challenges for your organization right now or where you see the largest opportunities for innovators in biologicals. 
I mean, I think, you know, having biologicals that, um, you know, work with current IPM regimes and our drop-ins um, and work alongside synthetic chemistry is incredibly important. I think, um, you know, the, that's the biggest opportunity, right? Developing solutions that work for growers, that work for growers based on what they're already doing and don't, you know, create complexities of use. Um, that's a really, really important opportunity in biologicals. I think part of the biggest challenge that we have when it comes to developing biologicals is, you know, creating solutions really um, that work uh, across the, the board. Um, as I said, as grower wants, growers want them to work and work consistently. Um, I think John alluded to this earlier. Um, some of the previous generations of biocidal solutions didn't always work as they said that they or they claimed to work. And that's created a little bit of distrust, I think, in amongst growers as to you know, the utility of biologicals, the value of biologicals, and there's a bit of work to kind of undo that reputation, particularly on the biopesticide front. Excellent. Okay. Well, with that, I think we're going to end and that will allow us to have a little bit of a conversation here for those of us in person still get to chat with each other. Um, can everyone help me in thanking John and Ingrid for spending their time with us first? <laughs>